afternoon, everyone. Uh, obviously, I am not Anne, although uh, I will do my best to uh, do my best Anne impression if I can. Um, I, uh, I'm going to actually let our, our panelists today introduce themselves. I know uh, they're probably known to about 90% of, uh, of all of you sitting out in the audience, but I um, want to give them an opportunity not only to uh, introduce themselves, but do a quick recap of uh, what it is that you're working on right now, where your projects are, uh, and what's happening out there, because none of you have had the opportunity to be up on stage uh, yet during the show. So, Graham, you're furthest from me, so let's start with you. Great, uh, thank you so much, and it's uh, nice to be here today and appreciate your time uh, to come out and, and hear our, our session. Um, I'm Graham Downs, President and CEO of ATAC Resources. Uh, we have a couple projects in the Yukon. Our, our largest flagship one is northeast of Kino City. It's called the Rack of Gold Project. It's actually a polymetallic belt, um, but there is a significant gold mineralization at the eastern end. And then we also have a, a copper project uh, west of uh, Dawson, and we have a new gold and copper project just southeast of uh, Carmex called The Catch. It's very exciting. Um, and those are, and then uh, we do have one in BC as well, but uh, I'll stick to the, uh, the Yukon ones there. I'm Scott Berto. I'm a longtime Yukon prospector and a geologist. And um, yeah, I've, uh, uh, with the help of uh, many others, uh, launched a company called Snowline Gold last year. Uh, it's based around uh, a lot of uh, the projects that my father, Ron Birdall, and, uh, and I and, and our family have worked on over the decades. And uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, after, after lifetimes of, of prospecting the Yukon, we had a lot of projects that uh, had gotten sort of to the stage where we couldn't really take them any further as prospectors. And so we were lucky enough to team up with uh, a few uh, good uh, equity partners and, uh, and a shell, and we were able to launch Snowline Gold. And we've built a, an incredible team. A lot of them are here, I hope. Uh, I hope you'll get the chance to meet them. And uh, we've just uh, started on a couple of projects, actually not too far from Graham's projects, uh, from Attack Resources. And uh, we've gotten into some pretty incredible mineralization with the first drill holes into these targets. So we're really excited to have taken this leap and uh, excited to see where it takes us. Great, yeah, thanks, uh, like Graham said. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out today. It's nice to see everyone in person. Uh, it's been a couple of years now. Uh, so my name is Matt Turner, President and CEO of Rockhaven Resources. Rockhaven has been working, well, it's been working in the territory since uh, 2016, or sorry, 2006. So that's about, uh, what, 16 years or so. Uh, we started uh, at the Plata property, which is actually out near now Snowline's ground and, and uh, a part of a tax property portfolio, the Osiris. Um, and then in 2010, we decided to move to road accessible projects, one of which was the Plaza, which um, is now our flagship project. It's actually the only project that we own, um, but it's a camp scale, a porphyry to epithermal uh, system. Um, it's out near the uh, Mount Nansen mine. So it's road accessible. Uh, again, we've been, uh, we've been exploring out there since 2010. We've done a ton of work, about 130,000 meters of drilling over 600 holes. Um, we've got a nice high grade uh, gold and silver resource at a really nice grade um, and a very robust PA that was published about two years ago. So um, our next step is uh, PFS. So it's, uh, it's kind of rapidly advanced, but again, it's taken a while. We've you know, weathered uh, some pretty tough markets in general since that time, but, uh, which I think we'll be yeah. further talking about. But um, yeah, so it's been, it's been pretty exciting to to work out there and uh, we're excited uh, for the next steps. Mm, great. And so for me, it's a real pleasure to be able to, to moderate this panel because I've known all of you for uh, like at least 15 years, which is uh, somewhat scary to me, but lovely because <laughs> you're, you're all a lot of, uh, lot of fun and, and pleasure to know. So, um, but maybe more importantly, you've all been exploring in the Yukon for that period of time as well. And it's got probably your entire life. Um, exploring in the Yukon. So um, all very familiar, but I think what's different perhaps about this panel is that it, it really is uh, the junior exploration component as opposed to some of the, the more advanced projects that we've seen this morning. So, um, but our topic for today is critical minerals and uh, what that means in the markets and the capital markets. So um, I wanna dive into that space first and, and then we'll, we'll cycle back, but um, you're all well aware gold is not on the list of uh, critical minerals. And so 
Uh, we've had a nice little run with gold over the last couple of years. It's taken a bit of a, a downturn over the from a commodity price perspective uh, over the last couple of years. We saw that this morning in Alex Christopher's uh, presentation. Um, but I mean, to be honest, the gold price is still relatively high compared to you know the 1980s. So. Um, how are you guys feeling when you go out and, and speak with investors? You were all down at the Beaver Creek Investment Conference there a couple of weeks ago. Um, obviously, there's a big buzz and a big conversation about critical minerals. Gold and silver, the precious metals, just as important for a variety of other reasons. How are you seeing those conversations change and morph? And how are you morphing your stories? I know, Graham and Matt, you just both mentioned that you had copper projects as well. So you're obviously getting used to, to promoting those. So. Um, Graham, it looks like you're ready. Why don't you jump in with how those conversations are changing? Well, I, I think that's it's a really good point, and 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 we changed. I think that's one of the key things that happened to us. You know, my, our team we recognized that copper is is going to be a significant component moving forward. It is a critical. We need it. We absolutely need it, and we need to respons responsibly source it. And uh, the Yukon has an, an amazing amazing uh, mineral potential and can play a major role in that. So. We've been traditionally a gold company, albeit we, did, we do have a polymetallic belt with the Rack of Gold project, but we identified we've had always had, we've had the, the Connaught Copper project for 20 years, but we were so focused on the gold project. But now it's time to, to resurrect that project, and we picked up uh, another project in BC in the Tutagon, and then uh, we optioned a prop property off of Ryan Berkey, um, southeast of, of Carmack. So to your point, we transitioned a bit to have a more of a balanced approach to exploration and to be able to, to um, attract also to, to a point uh, more capital from the market because we had a, there's a major shift in where these funds around the world want to put their money. And one example, we were talking to Barrick, who had had a joint venture in our project for, for a number of years back in 2017 and 18, and we, we approached them and said, hey, you know, just want to give you an update. And they're like, oh, we want to hear about your copper projects. I'm like. Okay, <laughs> you know, it's just, so there's that transition. And then when we went to raise money in the spring, it was, it was almost mandated that you needed to put the money that they wanted to give us into the copper projects. It's not that there isn't an appetite for gold. There's always going to be an appetite for gold. And um, yeah, so I think there's a little couple tidbits from the capital side that, that we're definitely seeing. And it was uh, reiterated down in Beaver Creek, which is a major conference uh, Exploration Mineral Mining Development Conference in Colorado every year. Yeah, Matt or Scott, you want to comment on either of those? Some of the conversations you've been having? Yeah, well, I guess, um, you know, we are a, a gold-focused company, and that's uh, almost comes directly out of the investor sentiment. Uh, when we were launching Snowline, we were really looking for just a new vehicle for our whole basket of exploration projects, and as prospectors, uh, my dad and then and then me, we um, really targeted anything that looked interesting, whether it was tungsten or silver or copper or zinc, um, you name it. We, you know, we were out there um, poking around and looking at it, and so we brought this whole basket of, uh, of projects out there and said, you know, uh, to to a whole bunch of different uh, potential investors, let's uh, do something with this. What can we do? And uh, and ultimately, the strongest voices came out saying, you know, not really forget all this, but like we, we're really interested in these gold projects. And, you know, that was the, uh, essentially the third of our uh, portfolio that we carved out and, and put into Snowline because that's where the interest was. Um, but I mean, absolutely, I, I agree uh, with Graham that, uh, you know, these and with the, the broader uh, sentiment that, you know, critical minerals are critical and, uh, yeah, it's, it's important that we do find uh, good, robust, uh, reliable uh, sources and at least sustainably developed. Uh, they might not be sustainable because you can't remine it, but uh, nonetheless, um, yeah, and gold is uh, gold's important too. Um, it's not on the list, but I think it's interesting to see places like, uh, well, Lebanon recently where you have people who are going in and robbing banks not to get, uh, not to get rich quick, but to get their savings out, it's just, uh, it's wild. And so you see just in, in financial markets in general, gold really still is the, the bedrock there. And, uh, you know, to build a robust economy, you need something like that as a, uh, to kind of underpin it. Yeah, it still remains that, that underlying currency of uh, around the world, the one that's, that's generic. 
Um, I, I did want to touch, though, you brought up an interesting point on, uh, you know, the beauty of being an exploration company is that you have the ability to pivot. You have the ability to, you know, put your copper projects forward instead of your uh, your gold projects. But, I mean, Scott, you, you're, you're right. I remember looking at that portfolio that you guys have had and, and the variety of minerals and metals that you had. So have you had any conversations recently about pivoting and, and keeping those gold projects that are still, you know, the, the main pillar of that are driving the company forward, but looking at some of the other um, minerals and metals that you hold in the portfolio? Um, so well, that portfolio is separate from Snowline, and uh, and I think as a, as a junior, you have to be uh, careful with those pivots too. Like, yes, you can pivot, and yes, you, you want to be nimble, but at the same time, uh, people invest in companies for a reason, and uh, you don't necessarily want to call them the next week and tell them that uh, there's a whole new reason that you're pursuing. And so, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've launched Snowline focused on gold, and we've had a lot of really good traction looking for gold, and we've made some pretty uh, big discoveries. So we're kind of in a place right now where it would be, uh, I think a little bit awkward to, to transition what our goal is when we're uh, kind of uh, achieving what, we're, what we set out to do. Yeah, fair point. So Matt, over to you, the, uh, the conversations that you're having with the investors, but uh, also maybe you can touch on the critical minerals tax credit, uh, the fact that you have a porphyry uh, deposit, you know, the gold versus the copper. How do you, how do you uh, put those projects forward to take advantage of some of those uh, tax credits? It's yeah, a very good question. We... Um, We've really, like Snowline, we've really mainly focused on the precious metal part of our mineralizing system, um, partly coming from investors, partly based on the resource that we're already sitting on. Like I said, we're over a million ounces of gold, almost 30 million ounces of silver. So we've already got such a nice foundation there of ounces. <clears throat> so I think, you know, really the big, uh, the big, the big key that, that either shareholders or potential shareholders shareholders want to see is these pro, is this project specifically move forward and hence we've done so much work over the last two years on chiefly on the vein system but we do have <clears throat> the porphyry part of it which we've done a little bit of work on a couple of years ago we drilled about eight holes but um, well Scott and I were down in uh, we were down in the uh, at the con convention at uh, Colorado School of Mines in September and um, one of the geos from Ivanhoe uh, that was working on Oyotogo, I, I think, did he say they hit that deposit at like hole 261 or something, Sergey said? Do you remember? Everybody was kind of like in, you know, gasping, right? But it goes to show what it can, you know, how much work it can actually take to find some of these things, even though they can be mammoth deposits, but they're such big systems trying to hone in on the, on the, the, the best part of it, right, can take a tremendous amount of work. So. We've, you know, dabbled in the porphyry side, um, but we've really stayed focused on the, on, the, on the main epithermal vein system. And I think it's going to really work out for us, too, as we, you know, we kind of hit these next milestones. Yeah, great. So, um, and on the, the tax topic, credit? Sorry, I yeah, didn't sorry, touch the tax yep. credit. It's, um, it's still kind of a little bit unknown on, like, if it's really valid for our property to qualify for it. And it's kind of, you know, we, we just can't say for sure. So we didn't even touch it for what it's worth. We raised about $5 million back about three or four months ago and didn't even have a portion for the, for the critical metals. Okay, interesting. Um, so I want to I want to touch on a, a little bit of the capital markets and, and money raising. And you know, for many years we would go to the capital markets and we would talk about the project and the geology and uh, the structures and the mineralization alteration and, and what that meant and what that looked like. But uh, more and more increasingly over the the last couple of years, we've had uh, conversations about ESG, the importance of ESG. We've talked a lot about uh, infrastructure, which we've talked a lot about today. So. Um, you know, those are, are really important topics regardless of how big a company you are, but they are, they're scalable, right? So for a junior company, there's a, a smaller level of, of ESG that you're doing because you don't have the same uh, impact on the land. So can you talk a little bit about the, the scope of conversations that you're having around ESG or infrastructure, um, EDI, some of those, those topics, uh, more social, not so technical, um, that you're having and, and the types of questions perhaps that you're getting from investors. What are they, curi what are they curious about? <clears throat> so yeah, I think um, it comes up in every meeting now, and uh, it, as it should. And um, we, uh, I think it's basically on slide two or three of our corporate presentation. 
is just talking about, let's say specifically with First Nations. And um, um, so it's kind of hit right off the bat. We've got an exploration benefits agreement with Little Sam and Carmack's First Nation, which our project is, is within their traditional territory. And, um, you know, we talk about the, uh, just the benefits to the First Nation, the jobs, the training, all that. Um, and that's, yeah, that kind of almost front runs the, the main question that the, that the potential investor would, you know, needs, needs to ask in this day and age. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that uh, your point on scale is, is really interesting and really applicable. I mean, um, you know, we're not about to dig a, a mega pit or something like that with the work that we're doing. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're still out there on the land, we're still uh, active out there and we're still causing uh, surface disturbances and that sort of a thing. And so um, we've been uh, implementing and, and our, uh, our operations manager, Steve, was actually articulated, articulated it better than that uh, very well this morning when he said, um, uh, basically, you know, we're kind of scaling our, um, our uh, reclamation as we go. And so, you know, you can, uh, I kind of think about it with like, you, you're going to bed and you throw your clothes on the floor. You can get away with it one day, but if you do that too many days in a row, then you got a big job in your hands. And so it's kind of like that when, um, you know, we're progressively reclaiming sites and as we grow the project, um, you know, we don't want to end up with a lot on our hands out there. And so we've been uh, from the get go uh, building inventories like seed inventories and uh, botanical inventories of our, uh, our sites pre-disturbance. When we decide we want to drill a spot, we do that botanical inventory, collect the seeds, that sort of thing. And really it's a, you know, some of our disturbance uh, sites are, it's like the size of this stage, maybe just twice as wide. So it's, it's really quite minor, but nonetheless, uh, you know, having the materials there to properly uh, reclaim it and, and it's working. You know, we look at our pad sites from last year and you already have green shoots coming up this year and you know, they'll be back to normal uh, very soon. And so uh, I think that as we scale up, should we scale up, um, just staying on top of that uh, will really lead to, or will make it a lot more likely that we can have a, um, you know, a, a responsible uh, sort of development project uh, should it come to that, and um, and yeah, we that we are never really at risk of uh, leaving the public with uh, a mess on their hands or leaving our, us with a mess on our hands. Mm -hmm. Right, Graham, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, the, the gentleman talked about that, and uh, you know, I echo what they're saying as well. We're, we've been doing progressive reclamation, you know. Um, for a long time and I think we've also been in the you know being up here for so long and being uh, in with the communities early and, and, and being having an open yeah. being open to have a conversation at any time being clear about what we're doing um, and, and just making sure that there's good open communication that's really important always looking f to find ways like we forfeited a number of our claims that were in the appeal just because you know that's the right thing to do Finding little ways, because you're right, it's scalable. We're not going into development right now, but what can we do within our means to do something on every stage of those, the ESG position? And I really like that ESGI discussion that was brought up earlier. That's kind of interesting because social can be so many different things, but I think it's really important that for wherever you're at in the exploration cycle or development cycle, just see where, what you can do and, and talk to the communities and say, what, what is it we can do? We don't have a lot of money, but if there was something in your community, what can we do? How can we help out? Something that we, could, that, you know, we can actually do for, for you. So I think just uh, being open and willing to look at all sorts of uh, opportunities is really important. Absolutely, it's a great point. You're right, that, that open and honest conversation of where you're going and what the opportunities are and what the challenges might be yeah. uh, is a really important piece. Uh, I did want to just touch on the ESG plus I piece. Um, I think that idea originated from a gentleman named uh, Mark Podlowski, and uh, he wrote a great paper. He's part of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. Uh, so if anybody out there is interested in, in that piece, it's a, it's a really great paper. He's, he did a wonderful job. Um, there's a presentation on it as well. You can find it on their website. So um, I want to touch a little bit perhaps on the governance piece of the ESG because we didn't really touch on that. Um, you know, to me, some of that comes out of the CDI conversation, which, you know, I look at all of your companies and, and who's on your teams, and, you know, that's, uh, that's something that you've obviously all thought about. Um, but the G is so much more than, than that. It goes to how you govern your companies and, and what that looks like. So um, maybe how does that conversation come into the capital markets and the importance of, of a well-run company? 
Because it's hard when you're, again, a junior and, and uh, you don't have a full staff that's, uh, you know, perhaps responsible for, say, the financial management piece or, or those types of things. That It can be a challenge when you don't have uh, as robust a team as a major. So. Well, I'll, I'll give that a shot just because we've been really revamping and, and uh, a lot of our ESG right now and we're working through that. Uh, you know, we've had a, a male-dominated board for years and we, you know, I was like, we can't do this, <laughs> you know. Um, so we, I had known uh, Maureen Upton for years and we brought her on as a director and she has some ESG background because we, we need to learn and, and so, you know, and it's funny because, you know, this the ESG piece, we've been doing it for 20 years, but we're, we're not showing the world. And I think maybe that's, you know, we should be doing a better job of, because we're all doing it. I think we all want to do the best we can, but we're, we're just getting, trying to understand how to communicate that properly. So we're right now developing, you know, we're putting all of our policies <laughs> into, into paper and getting them onto the site. Like we're doing that. We've done, we've got our ESG, and we've thought about it. We've, we've worked through it and put down what we do it's just we've been doing it forever, but let's put it down and, and, and put the then get our governance policies in there and do something. Bring on Marine Upton, for example, on these government governance pieces. I'll be honest, there's not it all depends on the funds to bring it back to your capital markets question. Mm -hmm. Some you know it's it's a big deal for them. Sometimes you're in these speed dating things and it's just it's not something that you can get into. Uh, th these conferences and you know just like you know we've got 20 minutes we need to talk about you know what, what we're doing and um, but it, but you need to make sure that that's in your presentation you're saying we have it you know and, and a lot of the we're working with Digby and a couple of other groups to figure out about because reporting is going to become something that we have to do mm -hmm. and we're, we're working through that and seeing when and how we're going to implement that um, but I don't know where I was going with that but I mean th the thing is is just oh that's what it is is that if you don't have anything, that says as much mm -hmm. as anything. So you yeah. need to show that and go through the process of having something. Yeah, great point. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Scott, Matt, anything to add? No? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it it goes a long way to specifically focusing in on the on the G um, of uh, directing, just uh, I, I guess giving investors confidence in. Um, you know, in the company and in what you're doing. And at the same time, uh, it acts as a, a pretty good guideline for the company itself. Uh, you know, it's, it's not always clear uh, what, the, what the right path forward is. And so having uh, thought through those things and uh, kind of uh, come up with those plans and those policies in advance is, uh, it's very important. And so, um, yeah, both externally and internally, I think focusing on good governance is, uh, you know, it's just the, the way to go. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add that, uh, like, kind of like what Graham said, the exploration companies have been doing ESG for 20 years or we wouldn't be out on the ground doing work, right? So we've, uh, we did it before it was even an acronym. And uh, again, there's, you know, things that we can always better refine and work on as an industry in, in general. But yeah, we wouldn't be, have been out there the past X many, many years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, doing what we do. Yeah, and, and it's funny, it's actually been a few acronyms now, right? It was CSR, it was ISR, and then it became ESG. But uh, I think you bring up a really good point, great point and, and all of you did, is that we're not fabulous at screaming about what we do from rooftops and, and telling people what it is that we're doing and, and how well we're doing it. We, we tend to be very focused on the, the technical aspects, which, of course, are just as important, if not more important. But um, there's a whole other market out there that we need to speak to as well. So, um, so as I started off by saying at the, the beginning of this panel, you've all been Yukon explorers for 15 years. You've all seen great transition during that time. Uh, some pretty major movements, uh, again, socially, from a technical perspective, you've seen claims taking rushes and declines and back up again. Um, let's talk about the next 10 years because it's always fun to look forward a little bit. What do you think is going to happen in the next 10 years, either with your own projects or big picture, or perhaps what would you like to see happen in the next 10 years? And sure, I'm going I'll to start, assume I'll that start, you'll guys. all say we need a power Yeah, line. So I think let's it's going to be, from that one. That's well, I think it's going to be an incredibly <laughs> exciting next 10 years for the Yukon specifically. Um, one of the things we're seeing now is a lot of uh, uh, capital being focused on favorable and safe jurisdictions. Um, even even capital coming out of jurisdictions that they don't even feel comfortable investing internally on. So 
Um, a lot of that is coming up into Canada, and um, a lot of people are attracted by the Yukon. YMA has done a phenomenal job um, in promoting it, so shout out to Anne and Lyneth. Um, and then if you look, I don't know, I've kind of been, and I've kind of heard some rumblings about this over, I don't know, maybe the last couple of months, but <clears throat> I think it's obviously tied to the energy companies doing so well. And, um, you know, you look at the last, well, almost the last hundred years of mineral exploration in uh, maybe global, you could say, but let's just look at North America. It was when the energy companies came in and threw a ton of money into exploration where we really made, you know, some of the key discoveries, moved projects forward, probably killed some, some occurrences, but um, that's where the real kind of push. So <clears throat> you look back on when they came in, it was really kind of in the mid to late 80s, right? Um, and you know what spurred that? Well, there was unrest in the Middle East, there was supply disruption with, 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 with energy. Um, you saw it in the gas pumps, you know, in the early 80s, uh, prices through the roof. Supply line, su supply chain issues. Um, so yeah, lots of comparables. And then yeah, you throw in um, you know the fact that they were looking at you know ways to ways to to invest a lot of the money that they were making, and um, a lot of it came back to finding new mines. And yeah, it was an amazing time for us. So is that going to happen again? Man, I'd love to see it happen again. I think we all would. Um, I don't know if they do it again, but it would be pretty amazing if they do. So, yeah, if that happens. But I think regardless if that happens or not, there's still so many, so many positives for the Yukon. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And um, I think that looking back on kind of the last 10 years and the underinvestment that uh, has gone into the resource space in general, whether it's gold or, or uh, base metals or other precious metals, um, you know, at some point, that's got to catch up with us. And at some point, we need to find new things because the, you know, the economy is still growing. And sure, there are, um, you know, many uh, well-founded rumblings of recession and, and so on going on right now. But uh, for the most part, we've grown enormously uh, on a global scale uh, over the past decade. And we will likely continue to do that, even if it's a reduced rate of growth. Um, and, uh, you know, this, what's driving all that is... Uh, is materials and metals and, uh, and of course energy too but um and so the underinvestment that has gone into our space for the last 10 years uh, has really created something uh unique and whether or not that uh, that kind of pops you know now or in five years or even 10 years i don't know but uh at some point there there just has to be a reckoning where uh you know we we need to turn the taps back on and uh and find those things and so i think that uh I think that that is looming, uh, and looming in a good way, I guess, uh, at least if you're an explorer, um, in the, yeah, at some point in the not too distant future. And I think uh, just bringing it kind of back to the territorial scale, um, I mean, one thing that we're, that we're obviously seeing, and as per the last talk and, uh, and many good talks at this uh, show so far, um, is the increased role that uh, First Nations are playing in, uh, in resource exploration and resource development. And so, um, our project, our, our flagship asset, is in the traditional territory of the Nachanayak Dun, and uh, and we've been very fortunate to be uh, working with their their Dev Corp on uh, a lot of initiatives on our project to uh, to kind of help um, uh, facilitate uh, growth on both sides, where uh, where we're actually powering our camp with uh, with solar panels that we've leased from the First Nation, and uh, and the the restoration I mentioned that's with a, a Nachanayak Dun owned company. Uh, collecting those seed banks for us, and so it's great to see those kind of steps. And uh, and I'm sure you know there'll be uh, equity uh, conversations on the broader Yukon scale and, and that sort of a thing. Um, and so yeah, I, I think that that's a, a corner that we're taking, and uh, I think that'll be a, a major factor in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Great, good comments, Graham. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the I would echo a lot of that as well. I mean, I think the big thing for me, like for example, for copper, I mean, I just in ten years, copper is going to be over five dollars. There's my bold prediction, but I mean, it's just we we don't have these materials. It, you know, we 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 cannot we're not producing them, and there's a huge lag for them. And you know, I think the world is shrinking. I really do like, and and countries are just going to keep their own 
resources from now. You see it in the U.S., you see it all around the world, that the, these resources are, are going to be hard to come by. And we, we, Canada, and the territory is blessed with a lot of mineral potential, and uh, we can benefit that, from that. Um, I also, if kind of think about the 10 years and, and bringing it back to Yukon as well, you know, I think there's a lot of it, great initiatives going out there for the territory of, you know, renewing legislation, getting the SUB. A lot of these policies, you know, back to the 20, to our century, get these things done right. If we can work on getting the land use planning done, get that finished, you know, I mean, the big thing is getting certainty and, and, and having an environment where the, Governments are working together, and in, well, I think we're all tr try to, but we need to bring some of those things together yeah. to, to, to make the, the jurisdiction a great place t for everyone to work and benefit. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I think there's actually a lot of parallels between what you've all just said there. And, and I think, you know, Graham, to your point, the, the world is getting smaller and, and we're now 8 billion people. We've all heard that in the news this past week. Um, exciting, but we need to make sure that we're all working together and that whether that's on a local scale with our local partners in First Nations or whether that's um, globally to make sure that we're helping humanity and the greater population, there's got to be some level of uh, sure national security, but also um, sharing with our partners and, and making sure that everybody's looked after. And, you know, Matt, to your point, the, the energy companies, and, and I actually think of the training that happened in some of those energy companies, as with some of the, the major mining companies, um, you know, that was a great training ground for many uh, junior geologists to get their start. And um, I think it's an interesting one when we look at where that future is going to go. It's those energy companies that are now transitioning to solar panel and wind turbines and all these things that need the minerals and metals. And so whether or not they come and make either strategic investments or uh, start their own mining companies and, and start to, uh, to bring back some of that uh, way of the past, perhaps, um, is quite interesting. So um, yeah, we'll have to see where that goes, but uh, all great ideas and um, you know, working, working locally with our First Nations, the land use planning piece, that's a, that's a really big piece going forward. So, um, Graham, you kind of stole my thunder there, but I'm going to change it a little bit. My, uh, my final question for the group is, what do you think the gold price is going to be this time next year? And perhaps if it's not higher than what it is today, when you think it's going to turn around and be higher? I'll give it a shot. And I, and I always screw it up, so don't believe whatever I say. <laughs> we won't remember this time next year, so you really can't answer incorrectly. <laughs> well, I was, I was kind of looking at it this, this morning. I was like, you know, what is going on with gold? And I, you, you, don't, you, know, you look back to March, and it was actually over 2000 yeah. you know, And that's not that long ago. And then, um, I don't know. I mean, I, and I guess, and at that, that would have been 2,600 Canadians. So, so Canadian operating mines actually can make pretty good money at that, that amount. So to your point earlier, the, the gold price isn't that bad right now. It's, what is it, 2300-ish right now, probably in Canadian. So the price is good. If we can just maintain this, I think when you saw the, the US and Canada you know, putting in the interest rates over the last, whatever, seven months, gold went down accordingly. And then there's this thought that it was, they weren't gonna do anymore, so gold popped up in the last couple of weeks, up 100, whatever it was, you know. I think you're gonna see some more rate increases over the next, six months, maybe a year, but I don't think they're going to be huge. They can't be, because <laughs> that'll really ruin everything. everything. Um, but So I think in the near term, you'll see the, the gold price kind of in where it's at. But I do think by, you know, late next year, or maybe 2024, I think you'll, you'll probably see 2,000 plus again for sure. So I'll make a bold prediction, 2150 in January 2024. Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Write it down. Scott, Matt, agree or disagree? Um, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a geologist. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. It's funny stepping into this role and suddenly everyone starts asking me that. And I'm like, well, I don't know. There's gold here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do think, uh, again, looking at um, kind of looking at the uh, macro market environment, I think that we're in a uh, strange space uh, as far as gold goes, too, where uh, you know, traditionally gold is a hedge against inflation, but right now everyone is trying to be so forward looking and predicting, you know, what the Fed's going to do and what's that going to do to interest rates and the economy and so on, that, uh, that gold has had uh, the opposite effect. So uh, high inflation in the short term is, is bad for gold, the, the way that people are uh, looking at the broader markets. And I think that that can only go on for so long, it's at least in an in a environment of high inflation, eventually... Um, and with gold, uh, you know, maintaining a pretty reasonable value for what it is, I think that uh, 
if uh, if inflation isn't kind of immediately tackled, and I'm I'm not sure that it will be, um, then uh, then eventually that'll decouple, and uh, and gold would start to serve its uh, kind of historical role there as a as a store of value, and and I think when that happens, uh, if and when that happens, you know, then it could really really pop. Yeah. Number Scott. Answer. <laughs> I have no idea. You can write that down. Safer, yeah. Twenty-one fifty. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, on Scott's point too. Uh, inflation, stagflation, pressure on the U.S. dollar. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the crypto space getting pummeled over the last two weeks, and it's deservedly so. Um, so I think there's a lot of people that are like, you know, going to be looking more at actual like real assets something that makes sense to hold. <laughs> so I think kind of all that together, I'm still gonna be a little bit conservative, I'll say 1927 uh, US this time, <laughs> but we're at 1751 today or whatever. So, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's gonna be really good for gold. Canadian dollar, like Graham said, I don't know, we're at uh, but 75 cents. Um, yeah, I don't know what it'll do, that's probably gonna, probably track the USDs to some extent and yeah. I think what's important is that you all gave numbers that are better than today. So exactly. there is we're, a positive future outlook. We're optimists here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're all very optimistic on, on where the Yukon's going and, and what's happening. Yeah. Um, I just want to touch, because Matt, you just brought up a really good point with crypto, and um, yeah. I would add can cannabis into that conversation, in that so many of, so much of that, those dollars were raised uh, on the TSX and, and in Vancouver, and that really takes a large chunk of dollars away uh, from those dollars that are then available for mineral exploration and mining projects. So uh, that's actually had a, a pretty large impact over the last couple of years as well on, on the availability and, and the advancement of some of our projects and the dollars raised. So uh, fantastic. I think that puts us at time. So I will say thank you so much. Wonderful job. Um, and again, always a pleasure to, to have the three of you on stage. So thank you. Thanks, Kendra. Thanks,